Go ahead and turn to John 17, if you would. We're going to continue our series of messages from this prayer of Jesus. John 17, we'll be looking in just a moment at verses 20 through 23. And when we began this series of messages, of course, on what has often been referred to as the high priestly prayer of Jesus, we, we emphasize the fact that this is not really so much uh, an instruction manual on how to pray. I mean, we can certainly see uh, through the prayer of Jesus and how he prays, how we might also pray. But, uh, but more than being a, uh, a teaching on prayer, it really is a revelation of the heart uh, of our Savior and Lord, the heart of our God as he prays not only for himself, but the, the vast majority of this prayer is for us, his people. And of course, Jesus has already prayed that his people, and we, you know, the, we're the church, right? And when we speak of the church, we're not talking so much about the building that we're sitting in, but we're talking about us, the people. We're, we're the church, all right? And, and Jesus is praying for his church, for his people, and he's prayed that we might uh, be a people of joy, uh, happy people. Christians, we're to be happy. God is happy. I'm reading a book right now by Randy Alcorn, the title of it's Happiness. Uh, and it's about 400 pages of doctrinal instruction, just text after text, quote after quote, about the happiness of our God and how God desires that we as his people be happy. I'm using it kind of as a devotional book, taking a chapter each morning. And, uh, and it's just been a real blessing to my heart, a reminder that our God is a happy God, and as his people, we're to be a happy people. So Jesus prays that our life would be characterized by joy. He also uh, prays that our lives would be characterized by holiness. We sang of God's holiness this morning. Uh, the fact that God is high and set apart. Well, we too are holy in the sense that God has set us apart. He has set us apart from himself or for himself, from the world and for himself. We are holy. Uh, and of course, as we know, uh, this process of sanctification, we are becoming increasingly holy in a practical manner with each passing day. We're also to be characterized by truth. Sanctify them by your truth, Jesus said. Your word is truth. We are to be a, a truth-telling people. First and foremost, I believe that applies to what we are doing right here this morning. We are to stand before the world and we're to proclaim the truth of God's Word. And the wonderful thing is, is that in spite of much of our common cultural beliefs, there is indeed truth. And it's not just my truth or your truth or any truth, but it's the truth. Jesus even refers to himself as the truth, right? Isn't that what he says in, in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6? I am the truth. That's what he says. The way the truth is. And the life. No man comes to the Father, he says, but by me. So we're to be a people of truth. And then, as Neil shared last week, we are to be a people who are on mission. Jesus said to the Father, as you have sent me into the world, so I'm sending them. All right? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Our responsibility now, as the Gospels remind us, is that we're to go into all the world with the saving message of Jesus Christ, and we're to proclaim it to every people group, everyone who will listen. We're to be a people characterized by mission, a vocational engagement. Uh, so really what Jesus is praying, if you've kind of been listening this morning, as he prays for joy, he's joyful. He went to the cross, the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. Our God is a joyful God, a happy God. We certainly believe in the holiness of God. Jesus claims to be the truth in and of himself. I am the truth. And we certainly know that Jesus is a missional kind of God. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. So what Jesus is doing in this prayer, he's really praying that we might be like him. And that's the idea, church. Every day, becoming more 
and more like Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at another mark or characteristic of the church that Jesus prays would be experienced by us. Again, these are not theoretical issues that Jesus is dealing with here. These are practical issues. These are issues that we ought to experience in our day-to-day lives. And this morning, he prays for the unity of his church, for the unity of his people. This is something that we should experience. And not only experience, but we should experience it to the extent that it is exhibited in our lives. People ought to be able to look at us as a church and see our unity, our love for one another, our cooperation in the purposes of God's will. So he prays for our unity. I've I've entitled the message, Undeniable Unity. Uh, And and what I mean by that is is this. Well, first of all, if you read the scripture, even just our text today, we are indeed unified, are we not? God has made us one. As we sang, he stepped into the darkness. He called us out of that darkness into his marvelous light. He made us a part of the body of Christ. We are one in Jesus. So there is a sense, just like every other one of these prayer requests that Jesus has made, that we are indeed a people of unity. But now we want that unity to be something that is manifested, exhibited through the way that we live, through the way that we serve. Again, you could have seen it each night last week from 6.30 to 9. As the people of this church gathered, each with their own unique personalities, their unique gifts, And as they served together in Vacation Bible School to give the children this wonderful week of encouragement and teaching. And uh, and it was just a wonderful thing to behold. And that's how we should be living our lives. Not only here within the walls of the church, but out there in the world where the world can see the unity that Jesus has brought us into. So this unity is, is, is to be tangible. It's to be something that, again, is experienced, something that you sense that you are living within and that others will sense that you are living within and perhaps even wonder about. So we experience and we enjoy this unity within the body of Christ, so much so that the world around us will be able to see that unity in operation and, and, and wonder at its reality. Uh, you know, we're always trying to create unity in the world, aren't we? But if there's one word that would characterize our world today, our nation today, what is it? It's not unity, is it? It's division. We're a divided people. Uh, But not so within the church. The church is to be unified, and the world is to see that unity at work. Again, and think, that's the way things ought to be. That's the way things ought to be in my life. That's the way things ought to be in the life of our nation. Unity. Again, a kind of (coughs) joyful unity, joy in the the unity. In the 126th Psalm, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, but it's a song about the return of the Babylonian captivity, the, the Babylonian, the return of the Israelites from Babylonian captivity. They'd been there for 70 years. And so really, the people who were returning or who we speak of as returning from Babylon had probably never lived in Jerusalem. They had been born There in Babylon, all they had ever known was captivity, slavery, hardship. But as the Lord had promised, that captivity was only going to last 70 years. And so at the end of the 70 years, the scripture says that the the Lord God moved upon the heart of King Cyrus and he let the people go. He released them from their captivity and, and, and they traveled home. They made their way back to Jerusalem. And the Bible says as they went along their way, they rejoiced in unity, they laughed in unity, they sang in unity. And the second verse of that psalm says that they said among the nations. Again, these were the people who were witnessing this group of travelers, all right? They were seeing them as they made their way back to Jerusalem. The nations, the really we could translate that word pagans. The lost world. The lost world saw this group expressing and experiencing such joy and such unity in their pursuit of freedom that they said this, the Lord has done great things for them. And of course that gave the Israelites an opportunity to say, yes, the Lord has done 
great things for us. So church, we are to be a unified people. We are unified. We are one in the body of Christ. We just need to get that firmly established in our hearts and minds. We are one, one people of God. But we are to live our lives as those who take joy in that oneness uh, and in whom that oneness can be seen by those around us who would love to have something like this in their own lives but can't because it only comes through knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. So let's, let's read together. John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. The words will be here on the screen if you don't have a Bible or a device where you can read along with us. Jesus continues his prayer. Verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Let's, let's pray together and we'll look at these words. Father, we thank you today for this prayer of Jesus and for this, uh, well, this unity that you have brought us into, Father. And we pray, as Jesus prays, that this unity would be something that we experience on a daily basis. Um, and, and that we experience to such an extent that those around us who perhaps don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, who would not claim to be a part of the church, would see the, the joyful unity that we experience and, and want that for their own lives. So again, Father, open our hearts to what you would say to us this morning and change us. Lord, help us to live in light of this truth that we are one in Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. There's a prerequisite for unity. We've already mentioned it a little bit. He says, I do not ask for these only. These only that he's not asking for is for the disciples who were there that heard this prayer, right? There was a group of men who had been with Jesus in the upper room. They were hearing the prayers of their Savior and Lord as he made his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where eventually he would be arrested and then ultimately put on trial and crucified. And, and so it is, again, in these moments, these hours before all of that began to take place, that Jesus prays for the unity of his people. So again, this is a critical issue within the church. This is something that Jesus considered to be extremely important. So I'm asking not only for these who, who can hear my voice right now, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So we can honestly say that Jesus was praying for us in this moment. Because we who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ received Him as Savior and Lord are the very ones that He's talking about. The reason that we've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, received Him as Savior and Lord, is because someone proclaimed the Word of God to us. We heard the Word of God. We repented of our sin. We, we turned to Christ and received Him as Savior and Lord. We're born again and again made a part of God's family, brought into the oneness of this, this glorious church of Jesus Christ. And that's the prerequisite for unity. People who do not know Jesus cannot experience the kind of unity that Jesus is praying for right here. The prerequisite is, is belief in Jesus. And by the way, what that implies is that He is the only Savior. All right? Uh, there is no other. Again, in that declaration He made in John's Gospel, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, that verse concludes with the words, and no man comes to the Father except through me. So there is this idea here that this unity that Jesus is praying for is only possible within the body of Christ. It's only possible among those who have believed upon his name and received him as Savior and Lord, who have come to the Father through the one and only way that you can come to the Father, Jesus 
Christ. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter makes uh, a declaration concerning Jesus. He says this, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So I have to ask you this morning, has there been a time in your life when you've seen yourself as a sinner, one who needs a Savior? And in that moment of, of seeing yourself in that light, have you turned from your sin and repentance and received Christ as your Savior? And Lord, has there been a moment like that for you? You know, we mentioned this morning there were three children in our vacation Bible school who made professions of faith. In other words, they claim to understand this idea that they're sinners who need Jesus as their Savior. And they prayed to receive Him. Now they want to follow Him in baptism and to live their lives for the glory and honor of God. Has that happened in your life? I can remember very clearly when it happened in my life right here in this church. 1982. When the auditorium faced the other way, <laughs> I gave my heart to Christ. I'll never forget it. It's changed everything since that moment. I'm still living out the results of that moment in time when God saved me and set me apart for himself. That's the prerequisite for this kind of unity. This is a unity that non-Christians will never be able to experience. So, we have to have this shared belief in Jesus, all right? Uh, and again, that shared belief results from a shared response to the preaching of the gospel. Paul, Paul would later write in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes by hearing. All right? And hearing by the word of God. So Jesus is praying for all of those who would hear the word of God, preached through the apostles, and would believe in Him through their preaching. And another thing, really, that this verse does, it reassures us of our success in our evangelistic efforts, right? You know, as a preacher who stands behind this pulpit regularly and proclaims the Word of God, if you're not careful, it can be a little bit discouraging. You know, you, you prepare all week, you preach your heart out, and then it doesn't seem that there's much of a response. But verses like this remind me that when the gospel is proclaimed faithfully, there will be those who will hear and respond and be saved. All right? So Jesus is praying for those very people, praying for us. And of course, then this actual prayer for unity is in verse 21. He prays that they, that we, may all be one. And look how he couches this. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I'm in you, that they also may be in us. Do you understand that? I, I struggled to understand that all week long. This unity that Jesus is praying for <clears throat> is something that is beyond our ability to accomplish in and of ourselves. It's a spiritual unity. It's a unity that we see within the Godhead. That's what Jesus is saying. I want them to experience the same kind of unity, Father, that you and I experience. Well, again, if you are bold enough to think that you know how to explain the unity that God the Father and God the Son have ex eternally experienced in heaven, uh, come see me this week. Yeah, maybe you need to be up here doing this message. So Jesus prays that we might experience... A spiritual unity that is seen within the Godhead. Again, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. And then down in verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. And then verse 23, I in them and you in me. So this is a spiritual unity that demands spiritual power to come about. All right? So, we mentioned this whole idea of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son. Of course, God the Holy Spirit, uh, though He's not as prevalent here as in other places, is also involved in this unity, the unity of the Godhead. And again, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, right? That God is one God in three persons. It's a, it's a belief that we hold to, but again, not one that we do very well explaining or grasping. It's a it's, it's a difficult thing, nonetheless true. Uh, 
So the three persons of the Trinity, again, Jesus says, I want them to be one as we are one. The three persons of the Trinity live in eternal unity. All right? There's always been unity within the Godhead. And there's always been a Godhead. All right? God has no beginning. He has no end. So the unity that they experience has no beginning. It has no end. There is this spiritual unity within the Trinity. A harmony. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're not the same, but they're one. And together, though their roles are different, they lovingly cooperate in the fulfillment of God's plans and purposes, His will. And that's the kind of unity that God is talking about here, that Jesus is praying for, that will be experienced and exhibited through His church. People of God, of course, are described, we've already used this term today, as the body of Christ. So we're described as a body. Now, we're all familiar with, with a body. We all have a body, right? So we kind of have an idea. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, he says, there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So again, this emphasis upon the oneness of the body of Christ. We are one in Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes this. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. Very important that we understand that, that there may be no division within the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So we begin to get this idea that as though, or although we are many in number, we are all one as far as our participation in the body of Christ. And God placed us here according to his own will. And he gave us, as we'll see in just a moment, gifts also according to his own will. None of us is exactly the same as anybody else here in this room, but we are to work together in unity, in harmony. You know, as I thought about that word harmony, I couldn't help but think about our, our music team up here. You know, we have a group of, of voices, and they're all different. And they all sing differently in different notes. Yes, yes with different notes. But when they do it right, it comes together in this beautiful song, right? Right? that we all get caught up in. That's the idea here. We're all different. Different voices, different gifts, different talents, different avenues of ministry, but we are to come together as one and serve together in harmony. Uh, so, this is the kind of unity that Jesus prays that we will experience and exhibit. Uh, and so we need to do that. We need to make every attempt to do that. And, and the reason that this is so critical, twice in this passage of Scripture, Jesus says that there is a, a purpose behind this unity, far beyond our own lives. He, he mentions it twice. He says, I want them all to be one so that the world, this is verse 21, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then again in verse 23, he says, a similar thing, I want them to be one, perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them. So there is a, there's a purpose or a promise to this unity. When the church of Jesus Christ walks together in unity, serves together in unity, worships together in unity, there is an attractiveness that the world sees and it draws them to Christ. So our unity is critical. You know, you may say of yourself, you know, well, I'm not much of an evangelistic person. God hasn't given me the gift to, to speak well or to, to be that bold. Let me tell you, we can be an evangelistic church by walking and serving together in unity, by being this one body of Jesus that, that Christ has called us into. The world will see that and they'll be drawn to God, the author of this Oneness. So the, the unity of the church facilitates, it really is, is essential to our evangelism. And of course the opposite is true too. Disunity within the church frustrates our evangelism. You know, sadly, we don't see a lot of unity, even in the church, do we? 
And let me tell you, the world's watching us. And when they see us unhappy with one another, at odds with one another, when they see division within the church, let me tell you, their natural response is to say, well, if that's Christianity, I don't want that. But when they see, on the other hand, people lovingly cooperating in the gospel mission, it's such a beautiful thing. It draws them, the scripture says, to Christ. They know that we're the real deal. What did Jesus say in John 13, 35? He said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples. In other words, they'll know that you're the real deal. And how is that? How will they know? It says, if you have love for one another, if you care for one another as a result of this oneness and unity. Now, the wonderful thing about our Savior is this. He's praying for unity within the church, right? But he doesn't just leave it up to us to establish and maintain that unity because we could never do it. So what does he do? Just like we've seen already in this prayer, he provides for us the very thing that he's praying for. Look at verse 22. He says, The glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Why? That they may be one even as we are one. So he prays that we will be one as he and the Father are one. And then he says, I've given them the glory that you gave to me. Why? So that they can be one even as we are one. So Jesus prays for our unity and then he provides this unity for us. In the very beginning of this prayer, Jesus asked his Father, you remember the way he said, glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. And I, I preached that text and I remember that in that message I said that these words were Jesus asked the Father to glorify the Son that he might glorify the Father. I, I said that these words were an expression of Jesus' desire, all right? The desire of Jesus' heart at this moment as he faces the cross is that God would enable him to accomplish the very purpose that he was sent to accomplish, and that in the process of accomplishing that purpose, he would display the very nature, the very characteristics of God himself, right? And that's exactly what he did. He went to the cross for us, displaying the love of God like no one had ever displayed, nor has anyone ever since displayed the love of God. So this whole idea of glory or being glorified, has to do with accomplishing the purpose that has been entrusted to us and really desiring to accomplish that purpose uh, so that God's nature might be clearly revealed to all who are watching. And again, we know that this is a desire that, that the Lord puts in the heart of every born-again believer. If you've been born again, all right, or if you're wondering, people often wonder, do I really know the Lord? Did the, the profession of faith that I made, was that real? Did, did, did something really happen before I was baptized? Did, did, did something real happen in my life? We wonder that from time to time. And again, the, the most certain way to answer that question is to ask yourself this, what's the desire of your heart this morning? And if the desire of your heart is to glorify God, to honor Him, to obey Him, to live in accordance with His Word, to accomplish the purposes and, and to do the good works that God has given you to do, then guess what? That desire is in your heart because God put it there. That wasn't the desire of your heart before you knew Jesus. So Jesus provides the very thing that He is praying for. And He gives us this glory that the Father had given him, this desire to fulfill the purposes of God in our lives. And by doing so, to clearly reveal uh, the nature, the character, the attributes, all right, of our God. To show the world how great our God really is. So that's why we pursue the purposes of God. And, and by the way, we started out, remember I mentioned the joy that Jesus prayed that we would have joy in all of this? We're to pursue the purposes of God with joy. Joyfully pursue the purposes of God. Is it hard? Sure it is. Will it demand sacrifice on your part? Suffering? Absolutely it will. 
For some, for many over the course of history, it is actually demanded that they die for Christ, become martyrs for the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you, if we're doing this the way Jesus is praying for us to do it, we're going to be pursuing the purposes of God with joy in our hearts and evident happiness that characterizes our lives. We will find the pursuit and the accomplishment of God's purpose deeply satisfying and even joyful. So again, God's provided this unity for us, this glory. And and he does that, you know, this enabling power. That's what Jesus was praying for. Father, give me the power, enable me to accomplish your purpose. Well, this enabling power to accomplish God's purposes, at least within the church, all right, because we're not praying or we're not anticipating the same kind of suffering and sacrifice that Jesus made, right? He was going to the cross to die for the sins of the world. We're to serve one another. We're to evangelize the world. So we want to accomplish God's purpose too, and we need the enabling power of God to do that. And what does God do? We've already mentioned it. He he provides us with gifts, spiritual gifts, that enable us to do this spiritual work. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, Paul writes these words. He says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So again, we get this idea, this this enabling power, this, this, this strength or really grace that comes from God to accomplish His purposes, which we desire, He gives us through spiritual gifts. Again, all of us different, yet all of it working together for the good of everyone. And then in Ephesians 4, Paul says this. He says, but grace was given to each one. Just in case you're wondering, you know, we talk about spiritual gifts sometimes. And I think that there are those of you who sit out there and say, I'm not sure that I have a spiritual gift. You do. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. You have a spiritual gift. You have this enabling power because God gave it to you. Of course, it says here in this verse in Ephesians, it says he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until what? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So again, it's all about the unity of the faith. And then he says, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So again, not only did God give you a gift, But he expects you to use that gift. When each part is working properly, when each person is serving in the capacity that God has gifted him or her to serve, then the whole body is built up. Not to mention what that does in the world all around us. So, God provides us with the very unity that Christ prays for And then, finally, I I want to mention the the, the privilege of unity. You know what a privilege it is to be a part of this church, right? You know, Morris McCarg and I were talking a little bit uh, just before the end of Sunday school. I'd walked out into the hall, and he was there, and the rains had started, and we got to talking about just the history that we've had in this church and the joy that we've experienced. Uh, Morris has had three generations of family members that experienced vacation Bible school here at Calvary Hill. They were looking at pictures last night or the night before of, of, you know, the generational experience here at this church. And many of you have been here a long, long time. Uh, I've been here 35 years. Some of you have been here longer than me. We have this wonderful, joyful experience of unity. It's it's a privilege to be a part of a family like this. Uh, Again, you think about it. We were lost, we were rebellious against God, we were wicked, we were sinful, and what did God do? As as Pam shared a moment ago, He chased us down. He saved us. And then He adopted us into His family. I mean, it it would have been miraculous enough for God just to do something so great as to turn our lives around, to make us better people, to put us on a better track, but He didn't stop with that. He took away our sin. He separated our sin, the Bible says, as far from us as the east is from the west. He brought us and made us a part of his family, adopted us into his household. I mean, again, almost beyond our ability to fully 
comprehend. And so Jesus says, I and them, you and me, that they may become perfectly one. Why? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Don't forget those last few words. Jesus prays that we would walk together, serve together, worship together, live together in unity. Because when we do that, the world will see that you've loved them. Father, the world will see that you have loved these people that you've called to yourself and saved, and that you love them even, now this is the important part, even as you love me. Now think about that for a moment. That means just as, to the same degree, God loves you, Christian, to the same degree that he loves his son, Jesus Christ. We don't always feel that way, do we? I'm convinced that most of us, because again, what did we talk about this morning? We all make mistakes. We do the wrong thing. We make wrong decisions. We go the wrong way. And we think, uh-oh, God doesn't love me. God's not happy with me. Let me tell you, God loves you in spite of your sin. He loves you to the same degree that he loves his son, Jesus Christ. And when we walk together in unity, we experience that. We we. We understand it better. Uh, so we need to do that. We need to walk in unity. Just let that sink in for a moment. God loves you just like he loves his son Jesus. And that'll change the way you live your life. When this truth dawned on John, he said in 1 John 3, 1, he said, what manner of love is this? And that, those words, what manner of love is this that we should be called the children of God? It means that you don't see this kind of love just everywhere. This is a, this is a different kind of love than we typically experience in these parts. This is something outside of my experience until Jesus came. We sang how marvelous, how wonderful. Is my Savior's love for me? Are you experiencing that this morning? Are you feeling loved by God? You should. He loves you just as he loves his son, Jesus. And what's so great about this, not only do we enjoy the privilege of being loved by God, but really what Jesus is saying here is that because we are loved by God and because we're living in light of that love as we walk together, serve together, worship together in unity, that we will be known as people who are loved by God. You know, we want God to love us, right? But we also ought to want to be known as people who are loved by God. John, who wrote this gospel, who's he known? What's he known as? The beloved disciple. He was a man who was known to be loved by God. His life was so characterized by these characteristics that Jesus prays for in this text and others as well that it was obvious to anybody that got to know John, this is a man loved by God. We ought to determine to live in such a way that people will say, wow, God, still, God sure loves her. God sure loves that guy. So the watching world sees the evidence of God's love through the unity that we walk in. And of course, as we've said, they're drawn to that. They want to experience that kind of love for themselves. They want to know that kind of fellowship, that kind of oneness, because you can't outside of Christ. So, let's be eager, church, as Paul says this in Ephesians 4, 3, that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Again, there should be an eagerness, a determination to walk together, to serve together, to worship together, to love one another, to care for one another, to honor the Lord together, to pray together. All of this is what we're being encouraged to do. We're already one in Christ, right? So let's live out that unity before the world so that there will be no doubt in anyone's mind about God's love for us and our love for one another.